So, Chartres Cathedral, the Golden Book of the West, repository of hermetic, astronomic, geomantic, and geometric symbolism. What is geomantic? What is geomancy? Yeah, the Earth. It, it, it really is the, the science of controlling the forces and energies of the Earth, of mapping the energies of the Earth, geomancy. Um, what we have today is a degenerate form of geomancy that we've seen in, not that it's degenerate in itself, but it's, it's, it's a leftover, it's a holdover from a much more sophisticated science. When you see, you probably all know what a dowser is, right? Yeah. Dowsing. A dowser could be called a geomancer. Anybody in here ever done any dowsing? <laughs> Great. Okay. Actually, that dovetails right into what we're talking about here because these energies of the earth that the dowser is mapping and accessing um, is related to this whole phenomenon that we're talking about. Because what did I define as the, the grail symbol, the meaning of the grail? It's a symbol for a lost technology of human and planetary regeneration. So we most definitely have to get into a discussion about fields of energy, subtle energy, bioenergy, life energy. I mentioned Wilhelm Reich. How many of you are familiar with at all with the work of Wilhelm Reich? Good. Some of you are. Okay. Wilhelm Reich worked extensively with a natural force that he that he named orgone. Well, what he named as orgone has precedent in many different systems. You know, in the Hebrew Kabbalah, it's the ruach. In um, you know, it's we'll get to that. It's it's many. It's got many different names. The 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 key, the chi, the ruach, um, others. It's all talking about the same thing. It's talking about a subtle energy that not only pervades all living organisms, but the planet itself, and links the planet with the higher astronomical domain. And that's what Wilhelm Reich was getting into when he was basically shut down and incarcerated by the federal government. And that's a whole story that, that definitely sheds light on what we're looking at here. So at some point, we will get into looking one of the lectures, maybe the third one, we'll be getting into uh, a sort of an in-depth examination of what Reich's work was doing and what he was uncovering and how that fit in with archaic sciences and traditions. Also, I mentioned the work of Victor Schauberger. Are you familiar with him at all? Yeah. yeah. And his work with water. Yeah. And that dovetails right in. Think back to the Ace of Cups that I showed you. Yeah, there's, there's the whole... Yeah, so we'll get into that. So here is Chart Cathedral, and I just mentioned, I think, to Bruce that the builders of the of Chart Cathedral did not differentiate between art and science. This is a repository of high science and high art, and what they were trying to do was to achieve a technology of transmutation, and this is one of the preeminent examples. Now, it's my feeling that the whole enterprise of the Gothic building era was never actually consummated. It was never actually completed. If we look, going back to another little history lesson, we see that it started overnight, essentially, between 1130 and 1150 AD, over about two decades. This phenomenal thing is happening all over Europe. These tremendous cathedrals are literally coming up out of the ground almost as organic growing things. And that's how the master designers looked at them as living organic stones. These were living stones, right? These were not just inert blocks of matter. They were, they were conduits for the transmutation and transformation and transmission of energy. Before Shark was built, and it's built on a prominence, there was a sacred well there that had been a, a, a goal of pilgrims for centuries and centuries, right? Now, one of the consistent things that we will see over and over and over again with sacred sites is that they're always built with consciousness of the water and the presence of water. Springs, for example, are found at so many of the various sacred structures. That's, in fact, that seems to be one of the consistent uh, factors that we find 
throughout all of these, on every continent, the sacred structures are associated with springs, underground water. Um, and this gets back again to the Schaubergian and the Reichian, some of the Reichian concepts that according to Reich, water was a vehicle for the orgone energy, especially flowing water. And before he was able to get to it, I would, I would amend that and say, especially flowing water under pressure becomes a vehicle. We're talking, remember, we were talking about the arterial system of the earth itself. Well, what we're seeing here is, is loaded with symbolism. And I wish this, we're, we're cutting off the top, but if you could see the top of the two spires, this one has a great solar orb on it, and this has a crescent moon. And in alchemy, we find that the celestial currents, celestial energies, have a dual nature. And always they're symbolized, on the one hand, by the solar orb, on the other hand, by the crescent moon, the lunar force and the solar force, the masculine and the feminine, being brought together, being transmitted down these spires. At the same time, the geomantic energies of the earth are being drawn up. And within the ogival vault, within the chamber of transmutation, is where the fusion takes place. Yes. OK. Where is that located in there? And if I were to go in there and sit down, what would happen to me? I, you might just demolecularize. <laughs> <laughs> we would have to go in with very high, special high-powered magnets to reassemble. That might be fun. I might like it like that. I mean, I'm, I might end up there in a couple of months. I'll so. tell you. It depends on how much preparation you've done. <coughs> but what you want to do is you want to go down into the grotto, below to the well. Do that. You need to go down there where the Black Madonna was originally found. And, you know, just walking in the vault itself. And if they have the chairs removed, do the walk of the labyrinth. How many of you know that there's a labyrinth in Chartres Cathedral? Right? How many of you knew that that labyrinth circular labyrinth was the same size as this rose window. How many of you knew that this rose window represents the round table, the 12 signs of the zodiac, the great year, right? There's 12 petals on this cosmic flower that's in there. But how many of you knew that if you stepped across the threshold of the, of the, the gateway here, the portal of judgment, and you hinged the facade at that threshold, and you folded it down, the rose window would superimpose on top of the labyrinth precisely. And the labyrinth now provides a map through this cosmic domain symbolized by the rose window. So if you get a chance, walk the labyrinth. Yes? A, a map to... What? Well, <laughs> there we go. That's the question, isn't it? A question I'm st still pondering and don't have a definitive answer yet. But I'm hoping that when you have returned from there, you will be able to provide me with the answer I have sought. Well, I now, have it. I just will be in my component atoms. I... Well, in that state, you may find yourself susceptible to a to a download. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to. We're going to zoom in on the portal of judgment, this tripartite gateway here into the nave. Now, notice the, the, the main uh, gallery, if you will, of the cathedral is called a nave, right? For what other word do we, again, language of the birds, the language of the diplomats. We want to go back and look at these interesting, <laughs> intricate interrelationships of words. Nave, what does that suggest? Nave. Naval. Or, what? Birth. Birds? Birth. Birth. The Birth. navel. Birth. Right. The navel point, right, is a point from which things emanate. Now think of this. The birth is the transmission from one domain to another domain, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's crossing. It's piercing the veil between two domains of, of existence coming into this world. A ship, as, as in Navy, it's a ship. Remember, it's a vehicle that carries us across the water, see? The nave comes from the same thing because, and in fact, many of, it's, it's probably likely that many of the carpenters that were employed to set up the formwork for the stones had been shipwrights. 
and adapted some of their uh, their their shipbuilding skills <coughs> to being able to to create this incredible formwork. Without which they because see the vaults. They had to build up this whole scaffolding of formwork. And then the, the stones were laid up over that. And then once the, the, the mortar had set up, the formwork was removed. And tradition tells us that on the day that the formwork was to be removed, the master builder would go and stand under the vault to demonstrate his confidence in the workmanship. So now we're going we're gonna to zoom in on the portal of judgment. We look at the central gate and what we see here, we can get into a lot of this but I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it. I just want to call, point out a few things. <coughs> Here's Christ in majesty, seated on the throne, holding his hand up in the sign of benediction, holding in his other hand, if you can't, if you can see it, we'll see it better on the next image, a book. The book is closed and sealed with a lock. It's been destroyed probably during the French Revolution. Um, but see, the book is an indication of the doctrine that is being perpetuated through this grand textbook in stone. And in some cases you'll see that the book is open, and in other cases the book is closed. When the book is open, it's telling the initiate that there's a secret being revealed within the structure, within the fabric, within the proportions and the symbolism of the cathedral, of the edifice. When it's closed, it's telling the initiate that there are secrets in there that are still being withheld from the world at large. I would submit that the secret that's being symbolized by that book with the closed and sealed lock was intended for the generation 800 years in the future. Why 800 years? Because that brings us to here and now. <coughs> to this room tonight. Oh, okay. 800 years from that time. 800 years from that time, give or take. And there's eight pillars to the doorway. And what? Eight pillars to the doorway. Sure. Now, you see here the nimbus behind his head is a cross. We only see, we don't see the, the arm down here. Actually, his neck forms the, the third. You'll notice how it's flared out. You'll notice his neck forms the fourth limb of the cross. You'll also see that there's a winged lion, a winged bull, an eagle, and an angel. What do those represent besides the four evangelists, which is the standard interpretation? You know, the lion is Matthew. Fixed, fixed signs of the zodiac. You nailed it, man. That's it. In the astrological wheel, there are four signs. The fixed signs. The fixed signs, right? What are the four fixed signs? Starting, the fixed sign of spring is Taurus, the bull. Right? The fixed sign of summer is Leo, the lion. The fixed sign of autumn is Scorpio. But if you've got some astronomical background, you'll know that if you go out at that time of year in late summer when Scorpio is rising, immediately to its left, you'll see the constellation of Aquila, the eagle. So the eagle is the celestial counterpart of the scorpion. It crawls on the ground, but it marks that same moment within the annual wheel the annual circuit. Okay, and then the fixed sign of winter is Aquarius, represented by the angel. Now, in the astronomical sense, if you, there are four quadrants, four quadrants now defined by these four fixed signs. And at certain stages, roughly every 6,480 years, if you think of the line of the equinoxes and the line of solstices, forms a cosmic cross, and it's rotating. And every 6,480 years, that cross, that cosmic cross, lines up with those four fixed signs. Now, what does that have to do with judgment, the portal of judgment? Well, you've all heard of it. Judgment Day, right? 
Judgment Day. This is a reference to the same concept. What is Judgment Day? We'll get to that because that's a part of this whole multi-dimensional symbol that we're looking at. Oh, and then the Vesica. Yeah, you asked about sacred geometry. Here it is. This is the portal of sacred geometry. If I completed this arc of a circle, and I completed this arc of a circle, I would have two circles of equal diameter superimposed on each other so that the circumference of one falls on the center of the other. The overlap of those two circles is the vesica, the vessel of the fish. Turn it on its side, put a fin and a tail on it, and you've got the symbol of ichthys, the symbol of early Christianity, and also a sign of the Piscean Age the month of the great year, during which the vernal equinox has been passing through the constellation of Pisces, as it has been doing for the last 2,000 years, and will continue to do for a couple of hundred more. And then in about 400 to 500 years from now, it will be in the constellation of Aquarius. Okay, so what we have here is a symbol of not only the year, but the great year as well. And the cross becomes that symbol, becomes the symbol of the equinoctial line, the solstitial line, and the cosmic cross that's rotating through these four successive ages, symbolized by the bull, the lion, the eagle, and the angel. The vesica itself is also, in a sense, a vessel. Vesica means vessel. And you'll notice in this profile, it almost suggests a ship, doesn't it? It's also considered to be a gateway, right? It's the gateway. It also represents the birth canal. So it's a, it's a very feminine symbol because the female is the channel whereby souls enter this world. Notice that Christ, Christ sits at that gateway. And so does Buddha. Really in the same role. sometimes called the mystic almond. And here's another earlier Romanesque church in which the same thing. And notice, now, now that you're aware of these things, you look and you go, the book is open. It's even got some writing in it, doesn't it? And again, you see the four evangelical symbols. And here is the cover of the... <coughs> Chalice well, Glastonbury, England. What chalice are we speaking of there? The one and only Grail. And here you can see very clearly the two circles superimposed, forming the vesica, the vessel in their overlap. Now, in my sacred geometry courses, this is what we start with because the whole edifice of sacred geometry emerges from this symbol. The whole edifice of Euclidean geometry emerges from this symbol. It's, in effect, the first proposition of Euclidean geometry is the construction of this symbol. And then everything follows from that, which to me provides a really appropriate metaphor for, the, for what this stands for. So that's all of my sacred geometry classes begin with this exercise, creating the vesica, and then by degrees going through and seeing how it sets up all of the other forms of geometry. <coughs> all of the polygons, and all of the relationships, right angles. Um, and from this system, we, the, the, the medieval masons derived the two great systems of Masonic geometry, ad quadratum, which is of the square, ad triangulum, which is of the triangle. Now all I would have to do is I connect the line of centers this way, as is shown here. If I draw from the apex of one to the apex of the other, I've now created my right angle. If I draw from this apex to the centers, I've created my equilateral triangle. And there are the, there's the derivation of the two great systems of Masonic geometry. Now, through an esoteric process that was taught in secret, through a couple more steps, you derive the uh, geometry of the pentagon, which is the geometry of life, the fivefold. And here gets us back to this number five again that keeps showing up. Right? The Pentagon is based upon the number five, and all living things 
have the geometry of five. Think about yourself now as a living geometric symbol. Five, right? You got five fingers on each hand, right? You got five toes, five appendages, five senses. But more than that, derivative from the five is the so-called golden section or divine proportion. And that's something we could get into. It's, it's a tangent from exclusively focusing on the grail. But we could get into it at some point um, because it certainly does help to embellish the meaning of the symbolism. And it's something I get into in great depth in the sacred geometry classes. Um, but this is the lid to the chalice well at Glastonbury. What chalice? Of course, the grail. Now notice that it's the lid to a well. Remember I said <coughs> in these sacred sites you always invariably find the presence of water, right? So here, and of course this well is purported to have, according to legend, healing properties. And in fact, it even flows, the water flows red, apparently because of the iron oxides in it, but has always caused pilgrims and others to liken the water to blood. Okay, so we weren't going to really get into this. I just wanted to show you Chart Cathedral. Um, but now, since I've got this here, let me, let me digress on this for a moment. Here is a symbol. It's so mundane and so ordinary that everyday people look at it and never think about it at all. But here's a symbol that represents the 12 months of the year, but the 12 ages of the great year, the cycle. The, 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 from Aries, Taurus, Cancer, Gemini, Leo, Virgo, Libra, etc., all the way through the 12. You think of this as a symbol for the cosmic clock. Now, one of the things that I've been very interested in for many years is the great cycles of change. You see, we've grown up in a, in a, in a milieu, a scientific milieu, where we were basically taught that everything happens gradually, uniformly. And this is in, in, in marked contrast to the ancient concepts of time who didn't see concept as a smooth, linear continuum, but as a cyclic recurrence. And that within those cycles, there were, if we want to use more modern terminology, points of discontinuity. Within those points of discontinuity, change on, that was compressed, that was orders of magnitude beyond in, in, in uh, tempo of the normal rates of everyday change, right? Now in the work that I've been doing, I've been documenting, along with my colleague back there, Brad, we've been documenting the imprint in the earth itself of these points of discontinuity, where something has happened, something on another level altogether, right? Timothy, you're from Buffalo, and right up there you see uh, <coughs> Niagara Falls, thank you. For example, one of the things that I show in one of my programs is extinct cataracts. You know, Horseshoe Falls is a cataract, right? I show images of extinct cataracts that utterly dwarf Niagara, that carried several thousand times more water than Niagara carries, right? Now, most of the human population on Earth today does not understand that the history of this planet has been punctuated by these events that are so outsized and so extraordinary and the scale of the phenomena that they have left imprinted into the Earth is so vast that we have not been able to see it until within the last couple of decades. In fact, there was a, there was a man named J. Harlan Bretz who back in the 1920s and 30s traveled around in Washington State, Idaho, and Oregon, documenting evidence for this gigantic flood. And it took him 25 years to create a map of the geomorphic effects of this gigantic flood. And I mean a gigantic flood. A flood big enough that if one stream, say, were to sweep through here, 
in the region of Atlanta, once the flood had declined, there would be no Atlanta. It would be erased completely. It took him 25 years to make a map of these features that anybody now can see in 5 to 10 seconds. Because we now have satellite imagery. We have Google Earth. Right? So, back in Brett's day, three, four, or five generations ago, humans were not able to access this other level of perception that we now can. And one of the things that I am trying to, one of the ideas that I'm trying to get out there and build the case for is this, that inscribed into the earth itself is a message, a story in great detail. And it has been laying there for 12,000 years 12,000 years waiting until humans had evolved the sensory apparatus to perceive it. Within the last decade or two, we have achieved that level. But at this point, 99.999% of human beings on Earth are completely oblivious to the fact that they're walking around on top of a gigantic textbook, a gigantic manuscript etched into the surface of the earth itself. And it's there. And anybody who wants to challenge me on it, I welcome it because I can show it to them unequivocally that it's there waiting for us to decipher. The time has now come that the human race is going to understand that the surface of this earth has written into it, inscribed within the rock itself, a message from the cosmos. And when we perceive that message, it's going to transform our species. There's no doubt it's going to happen. If we have a future on this planet, it will have to happen. And it is the very secret of the grail itself. See, because the grail is about restoring the wasteland in the aftermath of one of these one of these events, one of these discontinuous events, one of these event nodes in the history of the planet. That's what the grail is about. Go back to the first books of Genesis. After Adam and Eve had been created and they were set down in the garden, what were they instructed to do? Four things. Be fruitful and multiply. Right? Be fruitful and multiply. Well, what does that mean? Well, see, we don't, up until now, we've not had a context for making sense out of that. What we now know, though, is that between 11 and 13,000 years ago, the human population came within a hair's breadth of becoming extinct. It's now well documented that all over the planet, simultaneously, the evidence of human occupation just suddenly ceased. There were quark rock quarries that had been quarried actively for, for generations, and suddenly all activity stopped. There were artifacts within the archaeological record, spear points, arrowheads, toolkits. All of a sudden it stops. Radiocarbon dating of human activity, of, 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 of communities, of, of campsites, of, of um, uh, places where people congregated and lived for generations, leaving in the archaeological record, in the rock record, the evidence in the form of radiocarbon dati datable organic material. And it all stops suddenly. All these things are happening suddenly. And over this layer, over these, these events, is a black layer that has been referred to as the black mat. Below that black mat, you also find the bones of gigantic extinct species of animals that inhabited the earth for hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of years. Woolly mammoths, mastodons, saber-toothed cats, giant ground sloths, giant camels, giant beavers, giant armadillos, on and on, 120 or more species of animals, prolific around the planet. Their remains are found up, and there they disappear at the same time as the human artifacts disappear. And capping the whole thing is this black matte layer. And why is it black? It's black because it 
contains a lot of carbonaceous material. And what is the source of that carbonaceous material? Soot. And at the bottom of that black mat layer, what did the scientists find? Since 2007, 2007, key year, what they're finding is hexagonal nanodiamonds that can only be created under intense unbelievably powerful regimes of pressure and heat. They're finding magnetic grains. They're finding microspherals. They're finding Buckminster fullerenes, which are these soccer ball shaped molecules. They're finding spikes of the platinum group metals, osmium, iridium. If you know the story of the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, which is where the dinosaurs disappeared 65 million years ago. Everybody by now knows that the almost certain cause of their disappearance from the Earth was something from space. Didn't they find a big depression down in the, not the Gulf of Mexico? They sure did. Yes, they sure did. 130 miles at least in diameter, and it's buried under a half a mile of limestone. How did they first get the clue that there was something cosmic that was involved? in a place called Gubbio, Italy. They were looking at a little layer. They called it the magic layer. And in that magic layer, they found that iridium, one of the platinum group metals, was many times more abundant than you normally find in the crust of the Earth. Because it's not found in the crust of the Earth. Iridium is a siderophile, which means it loves iron. So in the early days of planetary formation, when heavy iron sunk to the core, it took all the iridium with it and left the Earth's crust deficient in iridium. But where do we now find iridium abundant? Asteroids, meteors, things from space. So it was this signature, this fingerprint of the iridium that first provided the clue. Now guess what? They found at the bottom of the black mat layer, iridium. Osmium, right? So here, a mere 12, actually, and here's what the... Here's what to me is so astounding. The date of this event, 12,900 years ago. Well, given that each astrological month on average is 2,160 years, exactly half a cycle is 25, a whole cycle is 25,920 years. That's the full processional cycle for the Earth to go through one complete sequence of the, of the great year, right? Half of that cycle, think of the line representing the line connecting Aquarius at one end to Leo at the other end. Half of that cycle is 12,960 years. The dating of this event is now being given 12,900 plus or minus 100 years. Now I knew this date 25 years ago. And I learned it from my immersion into the archaic traditions. So it's very gratifying to me to see this date now emerging. I gave lectures in Warren Wilson College in 1996 where I repeatedly said, look at the date 13,000 years ago, 12,900 years ago, because that was a date that something very profound happened on this planet. And now the evidence is emerging and being scientifically confirmed. So what happened? The planet was rendered a wasteland. And from that wasteland, planet Earth had to recover. Now, what we see happening is that prior to this event, Earth was locked in the grip of a deep ice age. Now, what does that imply? Well, where you lived, Timothy, but 2,000 feet of ice over your head, <coughs> right? 2,000 feet. There was an ice sheet that reached from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean and from the northern United States up to the Arctic Circle, and it was up to two miles thick. There were no Great Lakes because they were buried under thousands of feet of ice. Detroit, New York, Boston, Twin Cities, Seattle, Montreal, all of the cities in Canada buried under ice. And it was also over northwestern Europe as well. When that, all that ice accumulated, it dropped sea levels by 400 feet. As sea levels dropped, coastlines migrated seaward, right? 400 feet. Can you imagine what, there's concern now, oh, sea levels are going to rise two and a half feet in the next century. 
well, what would it mean if the sea levels rose or dropped 400 feet? Which they did between 11 and 13,000 years ago. So sea levels migrated, right? So here in Georgia, if you wanted, if you suddenly found yourself transported back 13,000, 14, 15, 16,000 years ago, if you wanted to go swimming at the, the beach, if you went out now to the Cumberland or St. Simons or any of the areas along the beach, you'd be standing in the middle of a northern, what's called boreal forest, like you now find up in Canada. And roaming around in that boreal forest would be herds of mastodons, giant lions the size of horses, the giant short-faced bear whose shoulders stood six feet off the ground that weighed up to a, a, a half a ton to 1,500 pounds, probably the greatest predator of the Ice Age. Off the coast of South Carolina and Georgia, you would oftentimes see fleets of great icebergs floating by. It was a vastly, vastly different world. And somewhere between 11 and 13,000 years ago, it was as if some cosmic hand flipped a switch and altered the whole balance of nature on planet Earth. And in the aftermath, there were large, large areas of the Earth that were basically rendered uninhabitable for a while. Imagine the, the devastation of a Mount St. Helens, but on a planetary scale. Brad and I had the opportunity uh, in October to go visit. I've always wanted to go see Mount St. Helens. Um, it was my first time there, and it was very interesting to see the recovery in the aftermath of catastrophe. And it's quite phenomenal how quickly nature is recovering. But you see, coming out of the depths of that great ice age, it's interesting. Here we had the cold of the ice age, which according to some estimates was as much as 15 degrees colder than now, on average, right? So here in Georgia, up, even in, in areas like Kentucky, was tundra. And we're not talking millions of years ago, we're talking, you know, 12 to 15 to 18,000 years ago, see? Okay, now overnight, in a geological sense, the whole balance of nature shifted. The ice rapidly melted away. It, rapid, it melted away so fast that scientists have not been able to explain where the energy came to melt it so fast. They first realized in the early 1970s, when radiocarbon dating you know, came along in the 1950s, prior to radiocarbon dating, they assumed that the ice age had gone in this long unbroken for 100, maybe 200,000 years, right? When radiocarbon dating came along, and they started looking at the dates now, they realized some very uh, sobering things. One of the things they realized was that 26 to 40,000 years ago, there were forests growing under vast regions that were buried under ice 18 to 20,000 years ago. And what is interesting is it appears that the ice rapidly came back around 26,000 years ago and rapidly grew so that 18 to 20,000 years ago, it now swallowed up more than half the North American continent. And it was as if the South Pole was set right over Canada, literally, because the only modern analog to that environment of, of 15,000 years ago in North America is the South Pole, right? You had a polar climate. Now, within a matter of a few thousand years, that polar climate shifted and all of that ice melted away. But see, it takes energy to convert ice into water. So in the early 1970s, the scientists, the climate scientists back then were looking at this evidence and they realized something. They said, well, it wasn't 100,000 or 200,000 years that this was there and then slowly disappeared. It came on overnight and it disappeared overnight. Just like that, boom, it was gone. Now, they then, looked at, okay, if we allow five or 6,000 years for the disappearance of that ice, and they went out and they started tracking because they could see where the ice receded and then receded a little more, then receded more. And in 5,000 years, it's all gone. So they took, okay, if, if we start, you know, like in the Northern United States, or they went up to the, to the borderline of, of uh, the Yukon and Alaska, where the, the Northwestern edge of the ice sheet was, and they realized that in order to get rid of that ice in 5,000 years, you had to have the margin of that ice had to recede on average eight to 900 feet every year. Eight to 900 feet, right? Now that's assuming a smooth linear recession of the ice over the whole period of time. 
They then looked and they figured, okay, how much energy would it take to melt the ice that quick? And they came up with this number, 360 kilocalories, which is 360,000 calories of energy applied every square centimeter per year. Well, let, let's put that into context. What does that mean? Well, they then started saying, well, let's compare that to modern environments and look at how much incident solar radiation, solar energy is available. They started looking at different environments. They looked at the present environment of Canada. It gets really cold in the winter, right? It gets really cold up in Buffalo. But come spring, that snow melts away. It doesn't stay there and accumulate and build up to a two miles thick of glacial ice, does it? But that's what happened 26,000 years ago, see? So you've got this rapid accumulation of ice, the rapid melting away of the ice, and so now they calculated and they looked at different environments around the earth and they looked at African deserts. And they realized that the amount of available energy in an African desert was 200 kilocalories per square centimeter per year. But the amount of energy needed to melt the ice as quick as it melted was 360 kilocalories per square centimeter per year. So now think about this. The amount of energy available from an African desert turned onto the ice sheet for 5,000 years is what it would take to melt that ice that quick. Where in the hell did that much energy come from? They gave up. They said, there's got to be, there's something we've missed in the data. We're going to put this on the shelf and we'll get back to it. To this day, they haven't gotten back to it. They called it the energy paradox. It is indeed a paradox. Now, of course, what they weren't taking into account, they were trying to think of a model, how do you apply that much energy smoothly over 5,000 years? Well, it wasn't energy applied smoothly over 5,000 years. It was pulses of energy concentrated, where the, where the total of the energy was the same. But rather than smoothly uniform over 5,000 years, it was pulses instantaneous pulses of energy introduced into the system and the result of that was massive catastrophic meltdown and literal tsunamis of meltwater gushing off the ice sheet, sweeping over the land, washing away everything in its path, stripping out bedrock sometimes a thousand feet deep in a week or two. The world that pre-existed these events, when they were over, that world was gone. And that's the world that Graham Hancock has been writing about and studying for the last 25 or 30 years. And I had the opportunity in October, Brad and I acted as Graham's guide for he's writing a sequel to Fingerprints of the Gods. I don't know how many of you have read Fingerprints of the Gods. Yes, he's writing a sequel to that. Where he's now getting into understanding that yes, there really was a catastrophe. And when you understand the magnitude of that catastrophe, you clearly understand why there is no abundant evidence anywhere for what pre-existed. See, this is part of one of the great insights, the sobering insights, that the human species has to come to terms with. If we're going to grow up spiritually and psychologically, we have to realize that our ancestors experienced these events. And the memory of these events, the trauma of these events, is embedded in our very consciousness and is driving a lot of the things that we do today. But coming out of that event, after, after the dust settled, after the ice was gone, the sea levels had come up and stabilized the coastlines, this is when we see now human population hovering on the verge of extinction. We came very, very close. Now, back to the biblical admonition, be fruitful and multiply. Well, anytime you have a species hovering on the verge of extinction, what's the most important thing that you can do? Think of the American bison. It was down, turn of the century, it's down to what, 50 or 100 individual bison, right? Now there's so many bison, not as many as there was at the peak of bison, you know, 300 years ago, when there were millions of them roaming the Great Barriers, but there's enough of them that we can go into the Kroger store and buy bison burger, right? Well. Of course, the numbers of individual bisons are being contained through, through, through you know, bison farming. Were we to just open the gates and let them run freely, 
they would already have recovered probably be a million strong. Give another 10, 20, 30 years, they'd be millions of them. Somebody looking back 10,000 years in the future might not even, probably wouldn't even notice that that particular species came within a hair's breadth of going extinct. And for that very same idea is why we have not understood that we ourselves came that close to extinction. But just like with the bison, when its numbers are reduced to 50, what's the most important thing that they can do is be fruitful and multiply. And that's exactly the injunction placed upon the human species, at least as represented in the Bible, be fruitful and multiply. But what was the other two injunctions? Be fruitful and multiply, re Replenish the earth and subdue it. Replenish. Not plenish the earth, replenish it. And I don't know how that wording has, has, so many people have overlooked the implications of that wording. That they're there to replenish the earth. Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth. The final one is subdue it, which has also been misconstrued to mean that we have complete license to trample nature however we want. That's not what it means. We'll get at some point in our series here, we can get into the original Hebrew of what that means. The two but, versions of that, and the later one says more, take care of the earth. Take care of the earth, sure, exactly. To be stewards of the earth. But what we have to understand in, in all of this discussions now, and the politiz politization of the discussions of climate <laughs> change, is why I get frustrated with it, is because there's an attempt to limit the entire discussion to the anthropogenic effect of climate change, the human, ignoring the natural, see, because if we now look back in the record going back hundreds of thousands of years, we're going to see that the climate of this planet has been extraordinarily dynamic. I mean, think about this. We do not have an explanation for what drives the planet into an ice age and back out of an ice age. So not knowing that, how in the world can we say that the debate on climate change is all over? And that there's now a consensus on what drives climate change. Don't fall for that. Don't. Because it's, it's a politically driven, it's science in the, in the service of a political agenda. And that's not to say that there's not some good science coming out of the IPCC, because there is. But at the same time, it's also being subordinated to a political agenda. That's why <laughs> the, the average person does not see the body of research. All they see is the summary of the summary for policymakers which is written by bureaucrats, who cherry pick the findings of the IPCC in order to further this agenda of basically control. Because the outset of that, the objective is basically the control of the production, the distribution, and the consumption of energy. And if you've got control of that, you've got control of everything that humans do. But the problem with that is that we're ignoring the 800-pound gorilla in the room which is the natural dynamic climate. And if we ignore that, we're putting ourselves in peril. We really are. And so, in the aftermath of this catastrophe is when we find, stepping onto the world stage, the goddess. Right? During this period of Neo, the Neolithic, 6,000 to 9,000 years ago, in the aftermath of the great upheavals that ended the Ice Age, the planet went into a period of very benign warmth for 3,000 or more years in which the climate was in some places estimated to be two to four degrees warmer than now. There are places where in mountain ranges, tree levels were 15 feet, 1,500 feet higher than now, right? There was abundant rainfall. There was, and I'm writing about this in the series that, that, that's, that Shirley, uh, Sherry is publishing in the Oracle. So read those if you haven't, right? I, I've written like three or four articles now on this period, the age of the, the goddess, when, when humans, the, the descendants of the survivors, are worshiping the earth in the form of a corpulent pregnant goddess. And it's during this period when it's basically the northern hemisphere is Garden of Eden-like. When there was a long growing season, there was abundant warmth, and the human population rapidly expanded. Then, this was at the end of the age of Leo and going into the age of Gemini. Come forward to the age of Taurus. We're talking about 6,000 years ago. Climate shifts again. The climatologists refer to it as the neo-glaciation.
What happened during the neoglaciation? The climate cooled. The glaciers began to grow after contracting, in some cases almost disappearing completely during the Neolithic. The glaciers began to grow again. But bear in mind that during the Neolithic, people were living, it was very easy at that time to live a hunter-gatherer existence. Because for one thing, the top of the predatory food chain has been decapitated. And now what you have is that frees up all of the small game to rapidly proliferate. The warm climate and the abundant rainfall encouraged the you know, prolific growth of, of vegetation. And so it was very easy for isolated bands of survivors to rapidly reproduce, to live a comfortable existence, to essentially reach out their hand and pluck the fruit from the tree, right? But then the neoglaciation, neoglaciation came along about 6,000 years ago during the age of Taurus, right? One of those quadrants on our great wheel. The climate began to cool. Now, you had communities of people living and farming at 10,000 feet. They got frozen out. Now, during that 3,000 years, here's isolated pockets of survivors. For 3,000 years, they're expanding. Human population is rebounding, right? You've got settled communities, settled patterns, settled lifeway patterns. And now suddenly, the climate cools and disrupts the whole thing. And it's interesting that if you've ever uh, familiar with the work of Maria Gimbutas, the, the anthropologist, archaeologist, who's done extensive <coughs> studies and excavation on the Neolithic period, who, who named it the civilization of the goddess during this time, she reports, and I'm, it's in my next article, it'll be coming out, I've got quotes from her where she's saying that nowhere in that 3,000 to 4,000 year period is there any implements of warfare, of human conflict. It's absent, conspicuously absent. Now, the neoglaciation comes on, and what follows in its wake? Conflict. See? Now, let's get back to conclude this. What am I saying is the grail? It's a lost technology for the regeneration, the replenishment of both Earth and humankind in the aftermath of a catastrophe. It's how to bring the planet back to vitality, fecundity, fertility, how to accelerate that process. And I think that's the science that has been conveyed down through the generations in multiple forms to get to us now. Because we can use that science. We can, by understanding that science, we will have a roadmap to a potential future that could be beyond anything we can imagine right now. You see, we are really truly in our emergence of a global civilization at a point of bifurcation. You see, we can go two different routes here, right? One of those routes is going to lead to tyranny and authoritarianism. The other route is going to unleash the human spirit of freedom and creativity. Now, which way it's going to go? Could come down the the balance might be very very delicate. It may not take much to tip it one way or the other. But there are factions. Remember, black magic. He had to learn the ABCs, but without the use of black magic, just to use that as a metaphor, there are those who are committed to dominion over their fellow man, who are who are committed to control, and right now they occupy the instruments of power. Until enough people wake up and go, okay, your reign is over. You had your chance, it didn't work, goodbye. It's time to restore freedom to this planet. And I think that the next big thing for the generation coming up behind us is the complete abolition of war from this planet once and for all. Be done with it, we don't need it anymore. We are a global community of human beings and we don't need war anymore because we can now understand what the source of human conflict was originally. And we can purge ourselves of those traumas and grow beyond it spiritually. And that's the message in the story that has to go out from this point on. And that if we don't, if we don't, nature's going to have some surprises for us. As sure as we are sitting here tonight, nature will rectify the imbalances. And that's where we'll end it for tonight, yes. How do we purge that from our...
Psyche. Ah, well, by first of all, becoming aware of it. Becoming aware of it. Understanding the story, the greater story of the world at large, and understanding that that story has been miniaturized, compressed, if you will, and downloaded into each and every one of our own subconscious minds. And then? Then we'll see what happens. Okay. Listen, I don't have the final blueprint yet. In fact, that's why I want allies. That's why I'm doing this, because I want to inspire and energize people to get with this and realize that, hey, we've got modern science making these tremendous discoveries about our genetic code, about our place in the universe, about the architecture of the solar system, about the, 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 the probable delivery of, of life to Earth, how it got here in the first place, which gets us right back to the grail symbolism again, and that image of the streams of water flowing out of the cup into the hydrosphere, right? So we've got modern science on the one hand, making these tremendous breakthroughs, and on the other hand, we've got, we're recovering the bits and pieces of an ancient archaic science that has come down to us in the form of the Hermetic wisdom, the Kabbalah, alchemy, and the Grail symbolism, and Freemasonry, and so many others. But now we're in a position where we can actually begin to perceive what's the reality behind those symbols. And through that mergence, of these two great streams of knowledge, I have hope and optimism. So, next month. Thank you.